I was in the process of trying to get into Peking to study Mandarin, and I had asked one of my professors to find me a summer job in Hong Kong. He was very close friends with Raymond Chow, who had just left Shaw Brothers to form his own production company, Golden Harvest. So I was offered a job for 12 months as an office boy if I paid my own way to Hong Kong. I accepted, I paid my own way to Hong Kong, and Raymond Chow met me two days after I arrived, and in trying to explain what a film company was, he said, you can either be in production or you can be in distribution. And I said, well, I don't speak Cantonese, so maybe you better put me in distribution. He put me in distribution. That lasted all of two months until they needed a producer on a picture called Return of the Dragon, which was just coming back from Italy with Chuck Norris and Bruce Lee. And I was put on the picture as a translator. A month later, when that film finished, Raymond and Bruce came to Los Angeles to negotiate the co-production deal on Enter the Dragon, and I was made the producer on the picture. Bruce is a very complex human being. Um, first of all, there was no pretense about Bruce Lee. He was very much aware of who he was, what his roots were, what his background was. He was very proud of being Chinese. He was very proud of his martial arts. He was a perfectionist when it came to what he did, both in terms of martial arts and in front of the camera. He was truly a professional actor as much as he was a professional martial artist. So he was always striving for that excellence in front of the camera. He felt that that went half in hand with becoming a star. You had to deliver for your audiences. To that end, he was I suppose very demanding on directors and on producers and on screenwriters to give their best to make sure that we were actually getting the best possible product on camera. Um, when it came to dealing with the staff and, and dealing with the crew on the film or dealing with the office staff at Golden Harvest, he couldn't have been nicer. He was a very genuine, very sincere person and actually would go out of his way to make sure that the workers were taken care of and that, that they did actually have their time to go and have their lunch, even though we might be rushing to finish a setup. Um, I think he was also very aware of the fact he'd always had an ambition to be an actor and to be successful, and he was very frustrated in, in terms of how far he'd been able to progress his career in Hollywood. And when he came to Hong Kong and helped to redesign and reinvent how martial arts were used in the Chinese cinema, it was with an eye to using the Hong Kong cinema as a stepping stone back to Hollywood and using Hollywood as a stepping stone to becoming an international star. To digress for a moment, at one time, sitting in his office, he told me his dream was one day was to be a bigger movie star than Steve McQueen, who at the time was the biggest movie star in the world. It's a little ironic that 20 years later, more people probably remember Bruce Lee than remember Steve McQueen. Uh, once he became successful in Hong Kong, and, and I have to be very frank, I met Bruce in Hong Kong after his second movie had been released. He made, first of all, The Big Boss, which was released overseas as uh, Fists of Fury. Then he made a picture called Fist of Fury, which was released overseas as a Chinese connection. Um, and those two films have broken all the box office records in Asia. So when I met him, he was already established as a star, as the young star, rising star in Asia. Uh, although here in the United States, and in Europe at that stage, nobody really knew who Bruce Lee was. He had done a few episodes of, of Long Street and, um, and some episodes of The Green Hornet. So when I met Bruce as an American, oh yeah, that's Cato. It was very hard for me to relate to him initially as a big movie star. However, I can assure you, if you walked down the street with Bruce Lee or you tried to go into a restaurant in Hong Kong, you immediately became aware of how big a star he was. no star bigger than Bruce Lee in Asia, and I would probably say even to this day, there is no star, certainly there is no Asian film star that has ever achieved the level of recognition and uh, popular appeal that Bruce Lee had and continues to have to this day. It's a very different world today than it was, what's that, 24, 25 years ago. Uh, the Vietnam War was still going on. Uh, 
Martin Luther King had just recently been assassinated in the United States and, and racial relationships in America were certainly much more stressed than they are today. Um, the sensitivities of Hollywood were very different in the day, those days than they are today where everybody is politically correct in Hollywood. Um, I think the stories of Bruce and his run-ins with the Hollywood system are fairly well known to everyone. The story of how he was, how the TV series Kung Fu was developed originally for Bruce to star. Um, and the networks basically said they wouldn't use the Chinese in the leading, in the leading role of the series. Um, after Bruce died, I came back to the States and interviewed Sterling Silicon, who had also created Streets of San Francisco. And he confirmed the story about the fact that the network really wouldn't let him build up Bruce's part in the larger networks. Um, Bruce's career in terms of films was going nowhere. But the kinds of films that Bruce wanted to do were not the kinds of films that Hollywood was making. Um, Bruce was a very smart man. He was a thinker. He was a student of film just as much as he was a student of martial arts. And I think he realized that truly he needed to come back to Asia in order to take that first step. He knew very clearly once he made that step, once he was a recognized box office draw in Asia, the American studios would be interested. And once they were interested, then it was a matter of doing the right co-productions to maintain the creative control, the artistic control, that would allow him to then use those first films as a showcase for his talents, that would then allow the world, if you will, to, to embrace him and come to know him. The pictures that were made in Hong Kong were never designed to be shown outside of Southeast Asia. The first two were never designed to be shown outside of Southeast Asia. When he did Return of the Dragon in Rome, it was with an eye to maybe being able to sell it in Europe. But in Bruce's perfect world, he hoped that the first film that America would see would be Enter the Dragon. In fact, there was a very memorable day, a big scream out at the studio when Bruce found out that we had actually sold his earlier films into America and that they were going to be released before Enter the Dragon because he felt that Raymond Chow had betrayed him to a certain extent. Um, his goal was to be an international movie star and in doing that to be a role model not just for Chinese and Chinese youths but for, for kids all over the world. And I think to a certain extent he was far more successful than he ever imagined he would be. If you look at Western film and the way fights were choreographed before Enter the Dragon and the Bruce Lee films, they tended to be very stylized Western brawls. I, I use the term the John Wayne fist fight. Uh, after the Bruce Lee films came along, certainly it broke open the idea of using more than simply your fists in a fight. I think in terms of the Chinese film industry, it was totally revolutionary. You look at the martial arts films, or actually the Chinese films in general that predate Bruce Lee, the Kung Fu was very stylized and, and uh, almost laughable to watch. Um, and the swordplay movies were very big. When Bruce achieved success in Hong Kong, very quickly they stopped making swordplay movies and started making nothing but martial arts movies. And the truth was, he had a lot of imitators. Uh, everybody was trying to do the Bruce Lee style which, uh, if you get off into the esoteric side of Jeet Kune Do, uh, Wu Wei, Yo Wei, the style that has no style, was, was Bruce's philosophy, which was to take a little bit from every style of martial arts and every style of, of uh, fighting. And so he tried to employ that and apply that in each film to make each fight unique and different. Now, if you look at what the progression became after Bruce, the, uh, and after Bruce died, there are a lot of younger directors who studied those movies very carefully. And I've actually worked with directors and worked with stunt choreographers who can tell me, cut for cut, the scenes in Enter the Dragon, the fight scenes. I was at the premiere of a movie here in Hollywood a couple of years ago, and as I was sitting watching the movie, I thought, boy, that fight scene looks familiar. And later when I got the video, I realized that in the film, they had copied cut for cut two of the fight scenes that we had shot in Enter the Dragon. So to say that Bruce Lee had a major impact on it would be an understatement. I think the other thing that he brought to the idea of fights and to action movies in general was the idea of being a little bit more theatrical and being a little bit more tongue-in-cheek. 
that you can have fun with a fight and still have a lethal fight. And I think you can look at Into the Dragon as sort of being the high point of Bruce Lee's choreography. The role models that they had to look at before Bruce Lee came along were the Charlie Chan movies, really, or Nancy Kwan in, in uh, The World of Susie Wong, or a flower drum song. And the stereotypes were very much, you know, uh, Chinese with pigtails doing the laundry or having Chinese restaurants. I think that what Bruce showed was that Chinese, first of all, that Chinese actors had something to offer the world. That there was a whole world of film that America and Europe was ignorant of, which was martial arts films. And that by styling himself in the way that he did, he became, number one, the person to introduce the world to Chinese martial arts, and really in general to martial arts. And number two, to set a handsome leading man role model for young Chinese men to aspire to be, or to dream about becoming in their future. And I know for a fact, because I spent a lot of time <laughs> in Hong Kong in the Chinese film industry, he was the inspiration for the next two generations of young Chinese filmmakers out of Hong Kong. Uh, certainly, I think that in, a, in Europe and America, the idea of the poor, weak Chinaman that sort of got kicked in the seat of his pants and thrown out in restaurants or whatever went by the wayside when Bruce Lee came to the scene. Bruce Lee showed that you could have a macho leading man that also happened to be Asian. Again, put it in the context of 1972, 1973, the Chinese world was very much a fractured world. You were either pro Kuomintang and Chiang Kai-shek, or you were pro Mao Zedong and the Communist Party of China. There was no sort of pan-Chinese sense of nationalism or pride, at least that I can detect. I think that Bruce brought that sense of a pan-Chinese sense of pride. Don't forget, Bruce Lee was born in San Francisco. He traveled on a U.S. passport, but he was educated in Hong Kong and spoke fluent Cantonese. So he was one of that, I believe that that generation that, that came after World War II that went a long way to breaking down a lot of stereotypes all over the world. People that were born in one part of the world lived in another part of the world and became role models. I know that when you speak to the younger film directors in Hong Kong today, they all grew up on the Bruce Lee films. Bruce Lee is to them still an idol. When you talk about what would you like to do, the answer is I would like to make a film that could have as great an impact on the next generation as Enter the Dragon had on my generation. And I've been told that by not one Chinese director, by at least five or six. And actors, by the way. You ask Jackie Chan, who the biggest star in Jackie Chan's mind is, and he will say without a doubt, Bruce Lee.